Let's dive right in. This is the initial release for the CG Figures asset library, and it will have a bit more explanation than normal. As usual, there are timestamps below. As of this release, I've run CG Figures for over three years. I've released a variety of science-specific CC0 public domain assets under a pay-as-you-want or fully free system on Gumroad and BlendSwap. One thing I've wanted to do for a long time is compile everything into a single dedicated asset library that could be quickly deployed and used to build all kinds of things. It would be a project that I could semi-regularly update or add to, so any customers or users could just download the latest version and be off to the races. Easier for me to manage and much easier for end users to work with. When I started releasing models, Blender didn't have an asset library. It was also before the introduction of geometry nodes, and I've spent the past few months updating many legacy models to use geonodes in place of particle systems or other workarounds. I've also been adding new models, tools, and features. Until now, everything I've released on Gumroad has been under a pay-as-you-like system because the files were small enough. However, platforms like Gumroad require setting a minimum price for files over a certain size. The current library, when compressed, is around 330 megabytes, and it continues to grow all the time. To deal with this, I will be distributing this library from different platforms. There is a free version that is accessible through my website, cgfigures.ca. It's all made by me, or comes by default with Blender, with, I believe, a single exception in the form of one CC0 public domain cork texture. So you can use this library and everything in it for whatever you want. No attribution is necessary, though I do appreciate it if you throw my name or the name CG Figures into the acknowledgements, especially in published work. And of course, I really appreciate it if you pass along the library to other people who might make use of it. The other version I plan to host on Gumroad and perhaps later on Blender Market after I work through the approval process. Both will have a fee, and I'll be releasing them with individual and lab versions. Many artists, model makers, and add-on developers that I have encountered release their products using studio licenses that are good for a certain number of seats. In my case, the lab license is really directed at those running companies or research groups where they have the funds. The lab license is five times the cost of the individual price and really just goes towards supporting the project. I will also note that if I do end up having a Blender market version, I intend to have 25% of the cost be donated directly to the Blender development fund. So if you want to toss some extra support to Blender, that will be the best way to do it in the future. The best way to support CG figures is still Patreon, but for those who prefer to make a one-time contribution, these will be the options. To put it in real number terms, the individual license version will be 10 USD, and the lab version will be 50 USD. I will also likely turn on parity pricing on Gumroad, so it will adjust those numbers based on wherever you are in the world and sort of in line with the markets that you may have. I chose these numbers because they let me very easily relate them to the cost of supporting the dev fund. Three individual sales a month will cover the gold dev fund membership that CG Figures currently has, and if the sales volume or Patreon becomes stable enough, then I will very happily upgrade that to higher levels of support for Blender. I also wanted to make the free version there for people who have already generously donated in the past for assets that were available under the pay what you want model. So if you're already paid, no need to do so again, unless you choose to. To make this clear, no matter where you get the CG Figures asset library, it will be the exact same. Whether it is free directly from cgfigures.ca or if you paid for it on Gumroad or Blender Market, it's the exact same, you'll be able to use it however you want. If you do choose to pay, it's a one-time fee. All the new features, models, and tools will be released at the same time everywhere for both the free and paid versions. Really, this is a situation of if you can support it and want to, then awesome. Thank you. You're helping me support Blender. You're helping make this free for everyone. And you're helping me fund cool community projects and in the future provide unbiased reviews of useful tools and resources from the broader Blender community that I think are applicable or helpful to researchers and those interested in professional scientific visualization. So with that out of the way, I wanna answer some questions and add a special request. And so in order, and you'll be able to find these in the timestamps, what is this thing? How do you install it? How is it useful? What are the non-asset library files in here? And what did I not include in here based on what I've released in the past? What's next? What about other creators or the resources they've made available? What assets are in this thing? What have I used this for? What have you used this for? Can you, in this case me, can CG figures add X to the asset library? And then at the end, some notes on version compatibility, updates in the future, and finally, a request from me to you, the broader Blender scientific community. 
So for starters, what is this thing? The CG Figures Asset Library is a collection of every model, shader, or node-based tool I've ever released, as well as some new things that have never been released before now. It's designed to help quickly build science-related Blender scenes, either for journal covers, figures, or really whatever purpose. Everything has been built and tested in up to Blender version 3.6.4. Much of it is also compatible with 4.0, but I will discuss that more later on. How do you install this? First, download the zip file for the CG Figures asset library. Go ahead and extract it. And once it's extracted, go ahead and check the folder. When you open it, you want to see everything as you can see it here. So you don't want to see another folder that says the CG Figures asset library that then opens this. You want it to be just like this right away. And that's going to be important for the catalog tags. Once we're set up here, we can go to Blender. Back in Blender, simply go to Edit, Preferences, File Paths, and then you're going to want to go ahead and add a plus and find a new library that you can then add for the CG Figures asset library. I also like to change the import method from append reuse, which I believe is the default, to just append. And once you'll do that, Blender will throw up a little tag that says save your preferences. You can do that over here by just clicking and choosing save preferences. How is this useful? Basically, the asset library lets you build up complex scientific figure scenes quickly. It's drag, drop, and customize. I will be using it in all kinds of walkthroughs going forward, and many of the assets already have dedicated videos on the CG Figures channel explaining how they can be used. As a simple example, there is a large and growing collection of real-world scale chemistry glassware that you can use to build experimental setups. What are the non-asset library files included, and what isn't in here? In addition to all of the assets, there are a few extras and some things that are not included. I have two add-ons for installing modules and for converting documents to images. Those are not included with the asset library, but they are still available for free on Gumroad. In terms of extras, my default starting file is included, and it contains several workspaces that I like to use when working with assets, especially the asset importing window. It also has some settings enabled by default, including cavity and random colors for objects in solid view in the main layout. In addition, transparent backgrounds are automatically enabled. There are different sample counts for cycles, and all of the main settings for EV are automatically turned on, particularly those around working with glass. A specific and noteworthy addition is the journal render presets. This file is directed at those making journal covers for scientific articles, and it contains camera sizes and resolution presets for a number of journals, mostly in chemistry and material science. When you open it, you'll be automatically taken to the scripting window, where you can see a number of base settings. The file is easy to use. Simply open it and go to the scripting workspace. I have enabled several sizes by default, and if you just hit Run for the script, these will be added to your render presets, which you can see here. This gives you presets that are set to 300 DPI for the dimensions of the specific journals, which are all highlighted in the comments and are largely separated into families. There are notes at the top about where you might be looking to publish, but the main areas here are general covers, so letter size or A4, as well as very specific dimensions for a number of journals, mostly taken from the ACS or the RSC. If you want to use a different preset that is already on the list, Simply come down, find the one you're looking for, remove the comments for the BPY text, do not remove the hashtag on the cover type. On Windows, you can do this with Control, Backslash, then very simply, you can press Run, so we'll check the render presets ahead of time. You can see that I currently have Chemistry of Materials already here, so I'm actually going to add a different cover, such as ACS Nano. Checking again, you will see that ACS Nano is not currently on this list, but if I go ahead and press Run, the script will execute, my camera will automatically change, and now I'll be able to find ACS Nano right here. Very importantly, these are preset pretty much for every time that you open Blender. So if I go ahead and start a new scene, then I should be able to access that right away from my render presets. So ACS Nano right here, along with all the other journals. If I want to remove one of those at any time, so we'll remove that, we'll also remove chemistry materials there. Now, if we were to go ahead and start a new scene, you'll see that they are no longer in the render presets, 
but you can bring them back at any time the same way that we did before. So we'll simply open the render presets and let's go down. Let's re-add chemistry of materials here. Hit run, and we now have that journal back. What's next? I will be using this library in all kinds of specific tutorials moving forward. I will also continue adding new models, shaders, tools, and more. I hope to put together a bunch of specific demos, build whole lab spaces, and just generally expand it to cover a ton of subjects. Everything in it will be built entirely by me and will always be licensed to be public domain or royalty free. In fact, you can actually see the license on each of these, which should be listed right up here. When Geometry Nodes was released, it made it much easier for me to pre-build models that could be customized and used right away instead of having to provide tutorials for making very specific things from scratch. Having a shared library of assets makes it possible for me to make more videos on a wider variety of topics. And so while I will still be doing technical deep dives on specific things, particularly simulation nodes, I will prioritize making tools available for an easier out-of-box experience targeting researchers without 3D experience. The biggest and most time-consuming additions to this library will likely be basic simulations for particle effects and simple growth and more advanced simulation nodes for things like polymer assembly, epitaxial thin film growth, or ion and charge migration. What about other creators? The Blender scientific community is awesome, and in recent years it has grown considerably. There are tons of contributors who also make things for free and release them. Rio Mizuda, Michael Douglas, Nario Taberner, Giorgio Luciano, Brady Johnston, Briny, and Tropic McAllister, Michael Aristotle, Gabriel Musa, and many more. There's also a whole professional community and the dedicated tutorial makers. For now, I will not be including anyone else's models, materials, or node tools in this library. Even if they are released under a public domain model, I do not plan to include anything in this library that doesn't come from Blender itself, or unless it is a CC0 texture, i.e. the texture I use for cork rings is one of those, and I think it's the only example in the whole pack. In the future, I would love to establish a proper nonprofit where we have general funding to make the resources available, compensate or hire creators to contribute to the library, and support the development fund. At this time, though, I'm not prepared to take on something of that scope. If you want to add your own folders to this library with creations from other people, you're more than welcome to, of course. My personal asset library contains many things from some of the people I've listed, and I've added a link to Blender and Science episode four, which highlights all of their work if you'd like to add them to your own library or support their creators. I'll also note that this video has no sponsor at all, and any recommendation I'm making for these creators is just my recommendation. What's in this thing? This is a good place to say it again, but let's dive right in. At launch, the asset library already contains a good amount. I've given it some rough organization, and from here on, we'll go through each category and I'll showcase the whole nine yards. I am going to refrain from going into extra detail about every aspect of this library, as many of the components are detailed in other videos on the channel. That said, starting out in the biology section, we have a number of simple things, including the cell builder nodes, as well as a basic quick static bilayer and a number of different styles for individual phospholipids and phospholipid pairs. These have been updated to include all the five styles in the legacy assets, and now you can toggle between them using geometry nodes. I could demonstrate this by dragging the quick static bilayer into the scene, and you can see that I have a number of controls, starting with the distortion strength, as well as some more detailed controls in the geometry nodes where I can add things like cutout objects or empties. If I wanted to, I could then select the style selector for the fossil of the pair and update this to choose between different options, as well as choosing between curved or straight. And I actually have the same set of options available with the cell object. So if I go ahead and drag the cell object into the scene, you can see many of the same aspects are available. If I grab the style selector, I can change between these quite freely, and I have things like control over the cross section as well as aspects of all of the phospholipid seeds, densities, etc. As of right now, the biology section is a bit lacking in this library because this isn't my area of expertise. While I will aim to build everything out in the future, you may be better off looking towards some of the awesome development in molecular nodes for biology and biochemistry related blender. Moving right along, we have the CG figures geonodes. Many of these are simple tools. In the first section, there are the curve nodes, and I made these about a year ago for a project that I had not released because I was waiting for it to be submitted for a publication. This was actually the inspiration for the layer builder nodes. 
In the interim, Rio Mizuda has made a beautiful set of nodes that I have not fully explored yet, but they achieve a similar effect. In fact, we both designed and used them to make blood vessels. I've added the link to Rio's version in the description. I will say his version is much nicer than mine, but the nodes here are pretty much just for simple manipulation of curves. If we go to the asset importing window, we can set that up nice and easily by just grabbing a Bezier curve, creating a new GeoNodes group, and then using the extrude curve and the curve to form. And if you simply put these in and I duplicate this, then I can connect the input curve and the next layer radius, select both of these and control numpad zero or just join geometry. And now you can see that you have layers that will update based on the internal components and thickness. And if you want to, you can also add some extra bonus things here, such as bevel modifiers, just to clean this up. And of course, subdivision surface. If you come back to the geonodes, you have options for inserting aspects of the radius. And this is very simply for stretching or shrinking. You can see that you've got some toggle options here and that these would basically just work along the length of this curve, however long it was. Sometimes you have to deal with a little bit of unusual artifacting, basically just try and move the toggle points slightly more in line. And all of these update pretty readily. You have controls over things like how much these swell and where these start and control endpoints are. There's also a lot of bonuses for exploring aspects of the curd nodes, but I'm not going to get into them in this video. Next up are the nodes for papers to pages. If you use the PDF to images add-on I created, then this is the GeoNode side. I scrubbed the original paper that was in here and replaced it with these colored sheets for the demo, mostly for licensing reasons. If you come to the GeoNodes tab again, you can see how many of these are actually working and what they're basically doing for achieving simple effects. If you want more information, the original video for this is linked in the description. Finally, there are some quick tools. First is a fully procedural basic hexagonal grid that has the bonus aspect of adding the center points. I use this to recreate lithium cobalt oxide procedurally, as well as to upgrade both the graphene boron nitride and metal dichalcogenide nodes. In addition, there are also quick scattering nodes, which lets you toggle between hexagonal closed packing or cubic closed packing, as well as just random distributions of things. For the more ordered pack systems, you can also choose between the, or you can set rather, the spacing, as well as random offsets for both options. And this is just something convenient to work with. If you want to use the closed packing version, you can extend these out and you can control things such as minimum spacing. Again, if you want to investigate this further, all of the nodes are available in geometry nodes, and you can use this to distribute a collection of random things by simply choosing your collection here and then hooking this up to the geometry output. Probably my favorite part of the library is the chemistry labware. All of this is real world scale and it's relatively photo real. It's also one of the parts of the library that I very actively intend to build out in the future. Right now, it has a number of nice basics, and this release has some new additions, including real pasture pipettes with bulbs that you can, of course, toggle on and off and change the size between the two standard sizes of pipettes. There's also some tools for a quick scattering of vials, as well as some new adapters, or rather a new adapter at the moment. Unfortunately, there is no liquid filling option yet for anything except this one prototype vial, which you can see right here. But this is something that I'll be bringing to the others in the future. You can also hide the lid and hide the liquid. This part of the library, in my mind, really emphasizes my goals, though, as it allows you to very quickly create scenes. In my day job, I work as a lab manager, and we're in the process of redesigning our lab right now. So I'm actually using these ahead of time to do things like organize cabinets and the lab space to figure out where different parts might fit and make sense. Obviously, this is just a very simple selection of basic glassware, but it's something that is important, and there are other aspects of this library that I intend to do that with going forward. Hypothetically, in the future, these might be decent tools for showing actual reaction setups as well. The next section is for data visualization, and there are two parts here. One is a simple set of geometry nodes for plotting graphs, and that goes along with a matching tutorial that I've linked below. The other piece here is the periodic table that I developed. It has a number of different toggles and options. It's been detailed previously in a different video. Again, I'll link that, and it does need a little bit of updating, which will come in a future version. The figure elements section consists of simple graphics that are often encountered in my field of material science and device engineering. Many of these are pre-built device stacks using the layer builder nodes that I created. They cover basic thin film transistor architectures, as well as solar cells, including planar, bulk heterojunction, and perovskites for organics and perovskite cells, respectively. Relatively straightforward to use, all you have to do is drag these into your scene you'll have a number of customizable options. 
you can see here that we have to hide the sphere. We're also going to go down and hide the browse guide itself. But if we want to, we now have layers with labels that come pre-applied. You have a number of options outlined in the Layer Builder Nodes video, and you have all the bonus options of dealing with things with the browse guide itself. So you can see that if I increase the count here, it will automatically stack those up. And if I want to come into the Layer Builder Nodes, and I have options with things such as spinning, offsetting the individual layers, or moving by layer. And this can be used to quickly do animated setups. That is similarly true for all of the different base transistor architectures, which you can also see come with a number of materials that we'll touch on later. But here we have bottom gate, top contact, top gate, bottom contact, top gate, top contact. And of course, bottom gate, bottom contact as well. There are also generic stacks for any object. And if you come to the GeoNodes tab, you'll be able to see that this allows you to put whatever object you want and to stack it on top of each other. So very conveniently here, if I were to add some simple things such as a cube, a torus, and let's say Suzanne for good measure, then I can select my object only stack and I can choose these and they will all stack on top of each other. In fact, we're going to reset the location of all of our objects to center here, we'll hide each of these. Now you can see we have our nice little stack and we have all of our regular controls so we can move things up and down, we can separate them. This is actually very convenient for working with things that change such as the perovskites because it maps to the bounding box of the object. So we'll always keep the separation as desired. There is also a default layer stack that is pretty much self-explanatory, just simple layers. And if you were to check out either the CG Figures website or the Lassard Group website, you'd find many figures that look like this. They're a fairly stable figure, and I will be adding more of these going forward for other types of devices, particularly for batteries. In fact, some of the key elements for batteries are already also here in the form of porous structures. For another excellent video on porous structures, Rio Mizuta has recently released one. This is a very simplified version of that asset, but it allows you to control things such as the scale of the porosity, the porosity factor, as well as the minimum dimensions of this object. If you want to make a pore separator for a battery, this would be a good way to do it. You also have dimension controls, and of course, you can set materials or whatever you like. There is also, for the time being, a very, very simple drawing polymer tool. So if you want to, you can go ahead and tab into edit mode and then draw a simple curve, and this will create these polymers, which have a number of basic toggles. Right now, they are using an alternating pattern, but you can say, don't use a pattern at all, and it will set like this. You can also say, I'd like to change from an alternating polymer to a backbone polymer or a random rather polymer, and this has different seeds. You can control things such as the backbone radius, as well as the number of repeat units and the bead radius as well. And I've actually used this quite recently for a figure in an upcoming publication. The next section for functional 3D printing is a little unique. It contains the original thin film storage boxes that I created for use in my day job with the Lassard Research Group. These are little boxes that can be customized here, and they've been used in our group to store a variety of things, including solar cells, transistors, capacitors, and more. You have a number of controls over things such as the dimensions, whether or not you want a sliding lid, uh, the specific size of the things that you'd like to store, as well as some notes about the spacing between the divisions so that you can map this out to your specific task. There's also an updated version with a sliding lid that prints a little bit faster. And once you've tuned the parameters to get the fit here just right, usually takes one or two tries, then they tend to work pretty well. They take up less space. And we've been using these quite happily for a number of months. Finally, the functional 3D printing section includes something I made to help me model objects from reference photos. And that is a fully procedural real world scale ruler. It has inches and centimeters, which are correctly mapped to each other. You can make it almost as long as you like. I believe the limit is on the upper end of, I think, 100,000 millimeters. But if I were to double this and let's say take that to 610, then you'll be able to see that it updates and it actually maps the inches to the millimeters pretty much one to one perfectly. As a special bonus, the gradations are actually geometry. So you can see them in both solid view and in wireframe. And because I made this to go over top of images that I want to use as a reference, the shader by default is transparent, but it also has an alpha control here that lets you essentially hide this so you can see whatever you're looking at. 
And if I were to take a photo that had a reference scale ruler in it, then I would be able to use it to map something. So as an example use case of this ruler, this is the ruler object itself. I'm going to bring the transparency down. You can see that I've got a photo that I have resized so that the gradations on the ruler in the photo match with the gradations of the ruler. This little piece right here is actually one of the hinge locks for one of our oven doors, and the pin that normally goes along here is broken. So I'd like to model a replacement that I will then 3D print. One note when working with the ruler for modeling is that it can be helpful to come to the visibility section and just disable the shadow. If you have it in, it can overhang and that looks a little bit weird top down, so this makes it a little bit easier to work with. Once I were to go ahead and model that pin to the actual dimensions that I need, then I would just have to scale it up by a certain factor. That factor is actually outlined by this ruler, so if I go ahead and hit ready to print, then this will scale up enormously. And then this would basically allow me to directly export this from Blender using file, export, STL, and then I could slice this in a program like Cura and print it. In fact, I do print things such as the storage boxes that way. I have actually printed a number of things with this ruler. So basically this just lets you model in a real world scale and then quickly take that into a functional 3D printing type of application. The other neat thing is that because this is properly scaled, you can print the ruler itself and get an accurate ruler. I made a simple one with me that I carry around in my phone case. It's quite thin, so it's reasonably flexible, but you will need a decent resolution printer if you want to try and get the millimeter gradations, but they're pretty fun. So useful in real life and useful in 3D. I thought it might be worthwhile to keep the ruler around for the next section because this is a set of real world scale hardware components. And there's a number of basic pieces here. There's a variety of different sizes of T-slot aluminum. You can see that right here, starting off with the most simple 2020 T-slot. And this actually works in legacy versions of Blender. And by that, I just mean version two, version three, because there's no geometry nodes. It's just a solidify modifier that drives the thickness here. And this is the actual size. So if I were to line this up, come into our top view, this should be just about two centimeters bang on. There you go. And if I were to grab the two by four, 40. Let's see. Let's move that up to the four line there. That lines up as well. Same for the 60 and the 80, and of course the 40 by 40 as well. And so these are just different convenient little pieces that you can work with. There are also a number of other standard components, including simple V slot wheels, 3D printing filament that is 1.75 millimeters, a relatively standard NEMA stepper motor, and a power supply. This section is growing and is part of another project where I'm aiming to recreate all the basic parts of 3D printers that are used for budget automation of scientific processes. Largely, this was inspired by the challenge set out by Vittorio Sagiomo and others. And that was something where you could take a 3D printer such as the Ender 3 and use the components and repurpose them into simple and accessible laboratory automation. So ideally, this is something that I will flush out until I have a full Ender 3, which I am going to, of course, call the Blender 3. And then that would be something that people could assemble in 3D to experiment ahead of time before getting a printer or before looking at having a printer that they could then adapt to a specific thing. Basically, a chance to trial run some experimental design. Again, this is a work in progress and it will be updated over time. Next up is one that I think will be very useful. One of the most watched videos on my channel by far is about using the default material preview lighting in your own renders. Blender, by default, ships with eight different world lighting options, and using these is now easier than ever. I've very simply bundled them into material preview lighting, so all you have to do is drag them into your own scene. And if we come into render view, you can now see I have access to all that same lighting setup. If you happen to be using my default file, then you'll also note that film transparent is enabled by default, so the world will not appear in your background. But this very quickly lets you shift between different HDRIs, and it lets you model within Blender's own context. The modeling basic section is mostly just topology tools that are useful for cutting holes in squares or linking different numbers of faces. There are a lot of different images of these. I just took the time to model some of them and clean them up into standard sizes. I may add more of these in the future if I find myself using them or needing them. I likely will in the process of modeling more intricate pieces of glassware. The molecules section is definitely one of the larger ones. I happen to be a chemist by training with a major in biochemistry, and so I've put together a somewhat extensive collection of basic molecules that you might encounter day to day, or in common scientific visualizations, such as all of the amino acids, as well as a number of recognizable molecules, things such as caffeine or capsaicin, some standard solvents, 
and again, some simple molecules such as carbon dioxide, ethanol, and ammonia. Now, one thing that's worth noting here is that if you're using a pend and you drag all of these in, they will import with different materials every time. So you'll get a million different copies of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. If you use append reuse data, however, you should be able to import these from the different segments. And let's go ahead and grab D asparagine here. And let's also go ahead and grab adrenaline, bring that in. And you can see that we're actually using the same set. So if I change one of them, I'll change all of them. However, if I change this to something like append, and now I go ahead and bring in, let's say nicotine, then nicotine has its own unique carbon material that will now not update any of the others. So bear that in mind. If you want to be working with a ton of these, then try and use append reuse data. In addition, if you're looking for quick style options, you can check out David from That Chemist, who has a video on using grease pencil to add some extra flair to these, and I've linked that in the description below. There are also several procedural generators and custom setups for a number of different molecules, including a variety of carbon-based options, such as fullerene. If we zoom in right here and come to the Geonodes tab, you can see that I've got all kinds of control over things like hollow or solid, wireframe. I can also show or hide the atoms. I have various controls here. In addition, there are a number of other generators for things such as nanotubes, which you can drag and drop. And then again, you can control aspects of these through the Geonodes panel. Finally, there is a whole setup for graphene and boron nitride. There is a legacy version that if you scroll over, it will show you that it is only for Blender version 3. It also should work in, in fact, no, it should only really work in Blender 3. There's a newer version that works in both Blender version 3 and Blender version 4. This is based entirely on the new hexagonal grid nodes, and it comes with a number of benefits. You have much more direct control over the scale of the lattice here. It's far more performant. You have a variety of different controls, and you can set up all kinds of fun little things, including things like mixed bonds. I do not generally advise animating with mixed bonds, because while you can animate quite readily here, let's see, I'm oscillating between different options here. You can also animate the bond formation in and out. If you use mixed bonds, it's going to be relatively slow. So if I were to go ahead and press play on the timeline, you can see right now we're getting 24 frames per second, and this thing is moving around a little bit. If we increase the strength, we'll see that effect more obviously. However, if we were to switch to mixed bonds, you can watch that FPS counter fall off, basically fall off cliff, depending on the size of your lattice. And mostly that's just because it takes a little bit of computational power to get this done. However, this version works in three and four, it resolves a lot of compatibility issues, and so it's fairly fun to work with. In addition to that, there's a new set of lithium cobalt oxide nodes, again, making use of that hexagonal grid, and again, with much more control over the size. You can see all the lithium ions hiding in here. Basic controls outlined here. This will be one of the things that I use for making staple battery figures. There's a solidify available that you can see is just for when you have glass materials. I would recommend actually disabling this or getting rid of it if you're not going to use glass in your renders. There's the perovskite nodes that have a version 3.1 and 3.2. The 3.1 is really just for a very specific version of Blender 3, and I can't remember which one. 3.2 is the one that you want to be working with because this effectively works with every version of Blender that I've tried it on. It's got a number of basic controls, such as tilting the perovskites. This has its entirely own video because at the time it was one of the bigger assets that I'd ever created. Finally, there's a new little thing in here for quick perovskites where if you're really just making a layer that you want to easily adapt, then you can just drag this up. You can actually do some fun stuff with this as well. It's very much just scattering. It doesn't have nearly the same controls as the full version of the lattice, but you get to do some interesting little things with it. Of course, you can set all the individual materials and you can control things like the atom sizes as well. So just a quick tool if you're working with a very, very generic figure. We'll round this out with the metal die chalcogenized section, where you can see that, again, there is a version that is only compatible with Blender version 3. I've named these Legacy. And there is a new version that has, again, all of those same nice controls. This is really based on the same set of things that is used for the graphene and boron nitride. And this can do all kinds of fun stuff. So again, we have layer separation. If I want to bring these down to zero, and they would merge into each other. I can control the number of layers. It's relatively performant. If you uncheck mixed bonds, once again, this will be much more efficient. And again, you have that same distortion control. So if I bring the noise strength up, we'll see everything deform here in a kind of fun way. I don't think this actually reflects what this material would do, but it's just something fun to explore. And again, this should be compatible with Blender version four. 
So all of the legacy versions of things like lithium cobalt oxide are still included in the actual files for the asset library. Some of them use particle systems from Blender version 2. I didn't get rid of them, but I wouldn't use them, and they aren't listed as assets just so that I could keep everything clean. Rounding out the assets section, we have physics. And this, like the biology section, is a little bit smaller. Physics is not my area of expertise, and it may be a little bit harder to come by in Blender depending on what you're looking for. For electromagnetism, I recommend checking out Sam's Electromagnodes and make use of Blender's new simulation system to achieve some incredibly cool effects. You can find those on Blender Market. For experimental setups, many physicists already have access to 3D tools for building and simulating and exporting setups. There are also catalogs of STL files such as those offered by Thor Labs, though those are not necessarily free for use in whatever purpose. For more dedicated physics assets, I would recommend checking out Ryo Mizuda's growing series of offerings, which includes optical components, as well as some things like fiber optic cables. In terms of what I have, there's a very legacy system of fixed wavelengths for different lasers, and you can see all of those here. What you have to do is select this and then control A to make the instances real. For whatever strange reason, it does tend to duplicate everything, but it will give you access to all of the different shaders. I created these using an online tool ages ago. And of course, there is also the single wavelength asset that I created some time ago, where this is fully animated. It has its own video on the channel, I believe, and it has a number of different controls. One of the most notable being that it updates the wavelength based on the size. And so you can see the color change as you go scanning across the visible region. But it also has things like phase offsets, the different polarized components. You can shift between different types of radiation, electromagnetic shift, basically. You can also show the polarized components, and then you can set custom colors and do some basic things. Again, this is outlined in another video. Finally, there is a section for simple procedural scientific shaders. I've made a number here for basic arteries, as well as some that are more specific to material science for things such as bulk heterojunctions and perovskites or crystalline looking films. There are also some general shaders to create quick looks. Black and white that are flat for labels, a basic metal, glass, glossy, and matte material, and also a fun little jelly shader. Again, these are things that I'll add to as I go. There are several other shaders bundled throughout the library, but these are the ones that I set aside as being more customizable and potentially useful in their own right. And so far then, that is pretty much everything that is being released at launch. There will be plenty more, but this is how I see everything initially being organized and used. Of course, if you download it and want to rearrange it or add more to it, you definitely can. One worthwhile note here is that for each of these, it lists the license when it's something that I've made, and many of them also have basic tags that you can use to sort. To update the library all in one place, I use Johnny Matthews' excellent and free bulk asset tools, which you can find on Gumroad. Again, I'll link those below. Johnny Matthews' page it happens to be a particular goldmine for free basic building assets, things like desks, tables, chairs, and more. And I often use those to quickly build up scenes when I'm checking out how my own assets will look and fit into place. As mentioned, many of the things I've included in this library have been used in published work. At a glance, I have used many of these components to create figures for publications in at least a dozen journals. I've also used them to make or help make a number of journal covers, which you can find both on my website and on the Lassard Research Group website. In my day job, I've also used these assets and tools for projects like fully animating explanations of our research, or for even starting to recreate our lab space in 3D so I can better plan out how to manage it and make a better research environment. In addition, I know that many people have downloaded my models. I've had several reach out to me to share their work, and I greatly appreciate it. Ryo Mizuda's new Draw Along series makes use of some of the things that I've created to help streamline figure creation. If you end up using this library and are happy or able to share what you're doing with it, I would love to hear about it. You can email me, tag me on Twitter if it's still around, or comment on this video. And if you're okay with having your work showcased on cgfigures.ca, I'm going to add a testimonial section where I showcase some of that. I will always add links to published work on images as requested or to group research pages or creator pages. So bear that in mind. If you do send me something, I will highlight it. To address the question of, can you add X to the library? I get a lot of requests and suggestions. I am going to continue actively building this out, and I have a lot of ideas for how I want to expand it. If there is something that you'd like to see added or that you think would add value, please feel free to request it or suggest it. I don't necessarily have a ton of time to do this. It's not my full-time job. And so sometimes things can take a while or might be beyond the scope of what I can reasonably do. 
I'll always try to be as clear about my limits in that regard as possible. I don't want to promise something to someone and then I won't be able to work on it for a year. In terms of version compatibility, in the process of releasing this video, Blender has moved from version 3.6 and now version 4.0 is in beta. There will likely be some compatibility issues, though I have tried to check for many. Blender 4.0 also allows for some new node setups and tools that will be useful going forward for sure. I typically try to work to keep compatibility up to date with the current version, and things won't always be backwards compatible. However, I will not be removing anything that is compatible with, let's say, a legacy version or just an older version of Blender. Instead, I will either add descriptions for compatibility or I'll move them out of the asset browser, but still bundled with all the files that you download. And now my request to you. I can't guarantee that this will be maintained or supported for forever. If for some reason I am incapable of updating it or if my website expires, I am asking that anyone who uses this and has a copy of the library passes it along for free to anyone who asks for it. With many scientists, I know if you email them to ask for a copy of their published research, they will happily send it to you free of charge. I would like that same spirit of community and sharing to be central to this, so please pass it along. And with that, thanks for coming out and for sticking around through a very long video. I will be putting out some new tutorials in the not too distant future, leveraging this library for specific effects and figures, ideally in the five minute figure format. I'm also going to flush out some of the tools that I kind of glossed over here. Until then, if you found this useful, consider subscribing or sharing it with your friends and colleagues. If you are interested in supporting this project, the best ways to do that are either to access the asset library through Gumroad or Blender Market, which may not be available at the time of release, or by joining my Patreon. A huge thank you to all the supporters on Patreon, past and present, who have helped make this project viable over the last three years. Until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.